So at this time, I'd like to introduce Colonel Sergio de la Peña. Colonel de la Peña is a retired U.S. Army officer and boasts a distinguished 30-year career spanning various leadership roles in defense and international affairs. As former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Western Hemisphere Affairs, he oversaw crucial security and policy matters while managing defense cooperation programs for U.S. Northern Command and U.S. Southern Command. Prior to this, Colonel de la Peña served as U.S. Northern Command's Chief of the International Affairs Division and Commander of the U.S. Military Observer Group Washington, deploying personnel to U.N. missions worldwide. With a background in air defense, he strengthened military ties as U.S. Army Section Chief in Chile and as Army Attaché in Venezuela. Born in Chihuahua, Mexico, and raised in New Mexico, De La Peña holds a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from the University of Iowa and a Master of Military Art and Science degree from the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. He also attended the Inter-American Defense College, graduating with distinction. So please welcome uh, Colonel Sergio De La Peña. Wow, that was a, that's a wonderful introduction. Better than anything I've heard in a while. So I, I, there was one thing le left off my bio, and that is I'm also a cotton picker. <laughs> and I mean like a guy that picks cotton. I did five cotton picking seasons starting when I was about nine. So I, <laughs> I just want to make sure I cover that because I think it ties into this. So I decided the best way to address this audience is to just talk about some pictures that I'm going to show you and then leave some time for you to ask me any questions that relate to what it is that we're about to see. So this is, uh, this is the way you get into the U.S. legally. It takes about a year. That's how long it took us. Up on the uh, upper right-hand corner is the, uh, is the envied green card. That's me. That's 1961. So I went through the process uh, for about a year. Down in the, uh, down here is dear old dad uh, living in the lap of luxury with nine of his best buddies when he was a bracero. The bracero program was a, a worker's program back in the 1950s because after World War II, we had a bunch of GIs coming back from, from the war and they needed to go to school. So the best way for them to get to school was, you know, just take advantage of the opportunity, but all the work that they were leaving behind, somebody needed to do. So there was a deal between the governments of Mexico and the United States, and the result was you set up this program where people were contract workers. They'd come, work for a season, and then return back to Mexico. There were different uh, lengths of stay, and that, and, and that program was throughout the United States. So in <clears throat> about 1957, my dad decided or his bosses decided, we're getting tired of taking old Joe back and forth to Juarez because every time we went home, he would come up with a new one of these guys. <laughs> so dad kept on, every time he'd come home, there'd be another one of us. So this is me in the middle. And so he got his legal papers, he came to the United States, and then we came across. So in between this picture and the next, uh, I had 20 different jobs. I worked at a welding shop, I worked at a lumber yard, I worked on a drilling rig, I worked uh, doing three wheat, two wheat harvests in Oklahoma. Anyway, I had a, at the time of my life uh, culminating and going to the University of Iowa, go Hawks. We just did a, a pretty good showing. Unfortunately, we didn't win, the women's didn't win the, uh, the national basketball championship, but pretty damn close. But if you notice here, this is about how we lived. No, the, notice the stylish footwear? No shoes, because we only wore those when we get, went to visit people. But we had the time of our lives. So fast forward to living that American dream. Here I am with my platoon sergeant and uh, my best buddy, my compadre. This is by Fulda. So back in the day, we were defending against communist aggression by the Soviet Union. And uh, we trained up around the Fulda Gap waiting for the Russians to come in. They never did. So then the Russians figured out, hey, we, we know this. We have a philosophy, it's called by the bullet or by the ballot box. So when they couldn't take us on militarily, they decided we need to come up with a different tact. Let's go, before we get to the ballot box, let's try insurgency. So they, they did a pretty good job of that. 
Here I am in Bolivia teaching our Bolivian brethren how do you fight insurgencies. And I did the unsexy stuff. How do you do op orders? How do you do intel annexes? How do you do logistics? How do you do civil affairs and psyops? And that's the way that we trained our partners to make sure that they were able to defeat the bad guys. And we did a pretty decent job because guerrilla insurgencies in Latin America disappeared. So then you go over here. I was the army attache in Venezuela. So they figured out that we don't do well fighting. We don't do well with guerrilla warfare, but we can do a pretty decent job of manipulating elections. While I was in Venezuela, I saw Mr. Chavez go from a failed cooster because in 92 he tried to overthrow the government through a coup and uh, he didn't do very well. He ended up in jail, but he was a very avid politician and he was able to take his skills and get elected in Venezuela. At the time, um, we had probably one of the best relationships with Venezuela you could ever have. This is General Hughes, the director of DIA. This is General Guerrero Serpa, who started out as his counterpart, and as luck would have it, he became the commander of the army. So I had carte blanche to go anywhere and do anything uh, as far as access in Venezuela because the commander of the army is the guy that ran everything, so that's how I got things done. Um, when I left the army, um, I, uh, I did some work doing some defense contracting and some consulting, and then uh, about May of 2016, I decided that I didn't want to see Mrs. Clinton become president, so I thought, I'm gonna do whatever I can to see if we can stop that from happening. So I went out and became a surrogate for then-candidate Donald Trump. And this is me in Mexico City with the Mexican Congress, with a bunch of communists, uh, explaining to them how an immigrant from Mexico is defending a guy like him. And believe it or not, they were pretty receptive to my message. I said, look, there's three concerns that Hispanics have in the United States. One is the economy, national security, and health. If you look at what is happening to us now, we are $20 trillion in debt back in those days. And I said, to put it into perspective, it takes one, if you owe $1 billion, every man, woman, and child in the United States is gonna pay roughly $3. If it's one trillion, it's about $3,000. If it's 20 trillion, at that time, it was $60,000 trillion or $60, per every man, woman, and child. Now we're at 90 plus. So when I explained it that way, I said, look, when you destroy the economy of a country, you create conditions where people get things taken away from them. They get their food, they get their lodging, and then they get cranky. And when they get cranky, things get stirred up, and if you want to look back at what that looks like, go back to the early 30s in Europe. Look at what happened. People got cranky because things got taken away from them, and you've got to find somebody to blame, and you know the rest of the story. In 1939, the uh, Germans decided to invade Poland, and so that's what, that is a parallel to at least consider. So when I explained it to them that way, they said, oh, okay, we get it, that's a good idea. When I was at DASD, I was, uh, we had probably one of the best alignments with our Latin American partners that we'd had in history. Uh, this is me in the middle of a, coke, it's a poppy field in uh, Badiravato, Mexico, uh, in the Golden Triangle. Uh, at the time, we were working with the Army to see if we could get them to get off Paraquat and start using something that was a little bit more environmentally friendly, something like Roundup. Uh, <laughs> better than Paraquat. And, and here's me as, uh, you know, as, as the American dream would have it. I had an opportunity to be in a debate with Glenn Youngkin, and unfortunately he won. I didn't. But that's, that's my story. So that just gives you an idea of what legal immigration looks like and what it, can, what it can bring about. I came to this country not speaking a word of English. I flunked the first grade because I'm blind as a bat. And my mother told me, don't ever say anything to the teacher and bow your head when she talks to you. Bad mistake. And I was at the back of the class. I couldn't see the blackboard. Second go round, my first grade teacher says, reads what's up on the board. And I said, I can't see it. He said, what do you mean you can't see it? I said, I can't see it. He said, get up here. So I got up close to the board. She figured out that I could read. And then she decided to give me glasses. And that changed my life significantly from that point forward. So anyway, so that's my story. Now. Mark can remember this trip because we were in El Paso together. Uh, I want to show you what the immigration thing looks like and kind of explain some of the dynamics that go with it. 
This is gate 42. People wonder, how is it that all these people are coming across? They're coming across because we're letting them in. People line up on this side of the border. See, this is, this is the El Paso side of the river. This is the Juarez side of the river back here. This is the raging Rio Grande River. You can just walk on these little rocks and you don't get your feet wet. And then you come up here and you see the National Guard is going to let you in based on when the CBP says you let more people in. So they come up, they show their paperwork, and then they join this mass of humanity. And then at the appropriate time, there's a bus that parks over here, and then the door opens, and then Ali Ali all come free. You cross into El Paso. That's the way most people are getting in, with documentation, with us letting them come in. Now, on the Juarez side, this is what it looks like. They're waiting, they're getting their paperwork straight. Uh, I had the pleasure of talking to this young man. Uh, he was a paratrooper for Hugo Chavez. He was a halo jumper, military aged, coming here. I said it took him a year to go across the Darien and get all the way up here. Now to do that, you've got to go through some rough spots. And the Darien at this time wasn't as bad as it is now. And now it looks like an autobahn. People are just coming through by the hordes. Now, once they come in, they're indoctrinated into all sorts of interesting um, little messaging uh, that they get from some of the political handlers there in Juarez. This one, for example, says no to the indifferent fascist migratory policies of the CBP. That's Customs and Border Protection. Uh, here, you know, it talks about the right to come across is, is a human right. And so this is the kind of stuff that these guys are being fed before they even come across. And because they're all kind of lollygagging around waiting to see what happens, they get indoctrinated with all of this kind of stuff. This is on the Juarez side. Now, the reason that I went to Juarez is I wanted to see this facility. Notice that it is a, it's a Mexican government facility. And this is the place where 40 migrants died because of a fire. Now, how did the fire occur? The fire occurred because the people in Juarez are getting fed up with these guys running around being a nuisance. So they locked them up. And if you notice, there's like a little cage. They put a lock on the cage. The migrants decided that they wanted to start a campfire inside the building. So they stacked these mattresses that are made out of memory foam. The place set alight. And next thing you know, 40 people are dead. And so this is right across the border. From where I took that picture is where the processing center that I went through when I became uh, a green card holder. Now, what's it look like on the El Paso side? See this guy right here with his little package? This right here is the ticket to the promised land. That's gonna get him into, uh, into a plane it's going to get him into a bus, and it's going to get him distributed throughout the United States. These gentlemen up here, this guy is from, Bolivia, uh, from Brazil, Cuba, Venezuela. But most of the people that I spoke with that day were from Venezuela. The other thing is just about everybody's got phones. They live on the sidewalks. They, they, they live like this. Uh, when it starts raining, they find shelter in some of these places. This is, a, this is an El Paso. Uh, and then they're constantly being given food. We provide that food for them. So now, here's the challenge that we currently face. The CBP, when I was a young kid, my brother wanted to see how long it took the CBP to respond to somebody who was an illegal alien working in the fields. My brother was at the time about 12, 13, something like that. So he'd see the little light green and white plane flying above. He'd throw the shovel down. He'd run to the house. Within about 10 to 15 minutes, there'd be a little paddy wagon ready to pick him up. And he got lectured to about not doing that because the CVP didn't take pranks very, they didn't have a sense of humor in those days. But they were significantly fewer. And that's the kind of response that they had. Today, unfortunately, the CBP, because of this administration, has been turned into the coyote of choice. Because they are now the, they're now the smugglers of choice. Because the way it works is there's, there's three steps to getting to where you want to go in the United States. You have A, your point of origin, B, the border, and C, your destination. <clears throat> we cover the 
the cost from B to C. A to B is what the coyotes, the human smugglers, are charging that person. Now, or the, that's the part that they're responsible for, but they charge from A to C. Back in the day, they would have to pay the cost all the way from A to B to C. Now, we are paying the cost from B to C. So we've unofficially inserted ourselves into the human trafficking chain, and now we're a part of it. And guess who's paying for all of that? All of us. And so this is, this is the dynamic that you're seeing at play right now. Now, you know, we talked a lot about the getaways or the gotaways, and this is where the gotta, this is the part of the, the border that the gotaways go through. This is Sanderson, Texas. And if any of you have ever been in Big Bend country, it is not a lot of fun in the summer. It gets a little warm. This was in May, and it was 102 degrees. So you can just imagine what it's like when it gets a little hotter. This is where those people come to that we don't know. Some of them are just Mexican workers that have jobs with a particular place, with a particular uh, farm or business, and because Mexicans aren't allowed the easy access that everybody else is, which is another bone of contention with the Mexicans, because everybody else can get through except the Mexicans. And so this is where they come through, because they know the region, they know the area, and they come across mostly at night. Now, there's also a lot of other people that we don't know who they are, and they're coming across in places like this. And they don't wait for the magic gate to open, they just come across. This is another processing center. This is in Del Rio, Texas. So if you notice here, how are these people getting transported? Well, first of all, they gotta have a place to communicate with somebody in the US. So we set up phone banks for them to use. NGOs cover this. And so you can call your family, you can call your relatives. Uh, you're, they're gonna get processed here uh, so that make sure that you got all your stuff ready, your paperwork is straight. And then they put you on a bus and you get distributed throughout the United States. Now, Texas is taking a different tack now, and this is the Joe Arpaio style tent where a lot of the immigrants are ending up now because Texas is arresting some of those that are, that are found as um, those that are probably a little more egregious because you can't arrest everybody, but some of those that, that are repeat offenders or people that are going into unauthorized places, the Texas uh, uh, police system is now taking care of them there. So, how is it that these guys have the ability to get around to so many places? That's because th this is just a sample of some of the NGOs uh, that help m immigrants get into the United States. Uh, and this is, this is a, a laundry list of where they are. Now, if you notice, this is a limited number. If you go on any website to any state and, and put in migrant assistance NGOs, you're gonna get a whole laundry list by state. And so this is, this is the network of people, that's just in the United States. That doesn't take into account a lot of the NGOs that get people from throughout the world all the way up to the border. So this is the problem that we have with, with numbers. This is just from FY21 to 23. We're talking about 8.5 million people and that number has already grown. And I'm sure that, that Mark is gonna give you the latest and greatest because he knows it off the top of his head. But just, to, just to, for argument's sake, let me put it this way. So we've had seven million encounters. We've had one and a half million unknowns. Now, out of those people, you've got the drug traffickers, you've got the human traffickers, you've got the criminals. Remember, we're talking about the political operatives. Some of these people are being trained in Cuba on how to do business and in incorporating themselves into political parties inside the United States, and they're covering an agenda. They are active throughout the, the entire hemisphere, now they're here. So you got the political operatives. The spies, that's a given. I was speaking to a gentleman in Miami uh, who was visiting a, a camp that had the Marielitos detained uh, back in the day when we had, like, I think in his case, he said he, he saw two, a thousand marilitos. Out of the thousand, there were 20 that had backgrounds as spies. 
And that was back then. So you can just imagine how many people are coming in now. We've, we've, we've had, since this administration began, 40,000 Chinese come into our country. How many of those people do you think might have a background as either a spy or a potential terrorist? Because I think on the, it's probably more likely on the spy area because that's the way the Chinese operate. But this day and age, when we are involved indirectly in conflicts in Ukraine, we're involved indirectly in conflicts in Israel, and we're involved indirectly in conflicts in the Mandeb al Bab uh, in the Red Sea. So can you just imagine if the possibility of no terrorists coming in is zero? We have terrorists. They are here. It's just a matter of when they're going to manifest themselves. We do know that there's 285 that have shown up in this time frame in the terrorist database. When I was the DASD for Western Hemisphere, we used to get somewhere between three to eight per year. And we were tracking them because it was our job to do so. Because a terrorist threat is a terrorist threat and we had to make sure that from a military perspective, we knew who was here. Now we've got 285. These are knowns. The unknowns are a bunch. Now why do we care? Because in the Nova area, we know that the terrorists that attacked on 9-11 got their driver's license at the Springfield DMV. There's also the terrorist that wanted to assassinate the Saudi ambassador here in Washington, D.C., who, is tr who was negotiating with an FBI agent who was not an FBI agent, or with a, with a terrorist who was, in fact, an FBI agent. So that's, that's why this is a concern. And if you think about it, you know, the Pentagon is not in D.C., it's in Virginia. So that's one of the concerns that we have as Virginians. So how does all this tie together to the big bad guys? So you got China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. And, it's, and these have been our historic threats, and we want to keep an eye on them. And so if you have these people operating in our hemisphere, and with the shift that we've had that I'm going to go into here in a minute, of the alignment that these countries now have with, these, with, with our enemies, would it not argue for getting greater cooperation? Or at least you're going to have these, our, our partners look the other way when these guys want to do uh, their activities within the United States. We do know that the Chinese Intel Service has a presence in the United States. I mean, we've found that they have all sorts of activities taking place. Uh, we, we know that they have police stations in the United States where they keep track of their, the, some of the Chinese uh, migrants that they feel are a threat to them. And we're also seeing this reverse opium war. You know, we, we, uh, we spoke earlier about the issue of the opium war being an issue uh, with the Europeans. Well, they've decided to return the favor, even if it wasn't us that started it in the first place. But that's what you're seeing with fentanyl. That's a, that's a way to weaken us. And it's stated policy by the Venezuelans to flood the country with as many drugs as possible. We've got the issue with TikTok that is, is making it in the news. And the Chinese are really good about working with our partners to make sure that they provide uh, a lot of influence by providing loans. Russia, you know, we've got the Ukrainian war going on. Cuba is still a hub. Uh, and then every day you're starting to see closer ties with Brazil, and you see Brazil taking a, a walk on the wild side, and I'll explain why here in a minute. The Iranians are a presence all over Latin America. That means that those countries where they're present, it makes it easier for them to come into the United States, especially as we left, leave the doors open. So my point is that these attacks are going to come. So how did this come about? You know, we, we wonder about how is it that these things occur. The thing is that we've had the communists in our hemisphere since the very beginning of communism back uh, in the Russian Revolution. They created the Comintern. They were, their influence was throughout the hemisphere. And what we found is that eventually nobody was buying what they were selling. 
the wall came down, things fell apart, but things continued to, they, they continued to expand with their influence. And what you can see is the alignment that we had previously was fairly good with the United States. This is the alignment now. You've got Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua that are definitely communist states, and they aren't getting any better. One of the things that I find fascinating is that the news media does not cover all the things that are occurring today in Cuba. Cuba is, is being set alight, and there's, you don't hear anything about it in the news unless you go into Hispanic news, and then there you'll get an earful. But look at what's happened just since in the last three years. Bolivia, we had uh, come back to us for a brief moment, uh, and then they couldn't get themselves organized, and they lost an election. Peru went to the left. The president there was uh, aligned with the Sendero Luminoso, the Shining Path that killed about 70,000 Peruvians back in the, in the 80s and 90s. Colombia, you've got Petro, who was the uh, leader, or he was one of the members of the M19 movement that killed something like 10 magistrates and about another 70 people. Brazil, Lula is a convicted felon. He still, he, he got out because of an irregularity within the legal system in Brazil, Chile. You had a, a student rabble rouser who's now the president, Honduras. You have the former wife of a Cooster president, or he attempted it, it didn't work out very well for him. He ended up in Mexico. But now his wife is running Honduras. Guatemala, we're about to find out what this guy is like, but he's definitely taking a walk on the wild side to the left. Mexico, AMLO is a socialist. In Canada, uh, President Trudeau, you know, there are those that argue that he's, not a, he's, he's the child of Fidel Castro. I don't know if that's true or not, but his, his inclinations are in that direction. And then you got to watch out for the sheep and wolves clothing. You know, everybody's in love with, El, with uh, Bukele in El Salvador. But he's got 70,000 people in jail. They used to have like 35,000 gangbangers registered in, 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 uh, in El Salvador, but now you got 70,000 in jail. And I talked to people that went there and says, yeah, you can walk in the streets and it's all good. But if you say anything against the government, be careful. If you have any tattoos that look a little, a little untoward, you're going to jail. So we got to keep an eye on this guy. He's already violated his own constitution. He won by 80% plus of the popular vote, but uh, I, I, I'd be a little leery of this guy. So right now, the, the ray of, of sunshine is Argentina. They seem to be coming around. Paraguay stayed to the, you know, aligned to the center. Uh, Uruguay the same way, and, and in Ecuador, because of all of the problems that they're having with drugs, they may also take a step in the direction of El Salvador, but the more to be seen there. So how did these guys end up there? Remember I talked about the wall coming down, communism seen as a failed experiment? Well, it wasn't exactly the way that uh, Mr. Lula and Mr. Castro saw it. They figured we need to create something different so that we have this common turn type organization. So they created the Sao Paulo Forum in 1990. And it's alive and well today. And so when the wall collapsed, they, they included all the communist organizations in the hemisphere. They were the umbrella group for every communist group. They also included the Sendero Luminoso, uh, the FARC, the ELN, all of those. They've taken those off of their website, but all the com communist parties are still on there. They now have 123 uh, different parties, and they're in 27 different countries. And their goal is to get those political powers into, into office. And guess what? They've succeeded. Look at, the, look at the shift in alignment that we've had. So to add a little more to this equation, you created the Grupo de Puebla. That's Lula and, and, and Mr. Lopez Obrador. And other, and eight other heads of state. So now they have eight high-level leaders and there's 16 former heads of state. And what their job is is to produce the legislation, resolutions, declarations, and then also sell that cause. So this is where we are with the, 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 uh, the Puebla Group. The other interesting thing about the Puebla Group is that it's loosely connected, but it's the executive committee to the photo. They're all tied together. 
Where did these ideas come from? The left, that also used to be called the GUE in Europe. You can find in their websites, you can read what they say. A lot of this stuff is very much like you see with some of our political parties in the United States. So what relevance does it have to the United States? This is just a personal observation of what I see as what's happening within the United States and how we ended up with this border crisis. We w I would argue this, this is all being done by design. By the way, these are my ideas and this is my observation. <clears throat> so uh, this, is, this is my slide. Uh, I made it up because I saw this happening in Venezuela, but then I saw it happening here in the United States. If you'll recall, President Obama said he wanted to see the fundamental transformation of the United States. And the only way to do it is you've got to take advantage of a crisis. In this case, the crisis was COVID. And what that did is it generated immediate actions that uh, forced specific measures. You wanted to stoke racial division. You wanted to weaken electoral integrity. You opened the border. You politicize the military. You weaken public safety, you know, defund the police, all that kind of stuff. And the way that you make sure it happens is you put out a bunch of subjective executive orders. And then you have the enforcers. The BLM Antifa thing is nothing new. If you'll recall that before that happened, before the summer of love, quote unquote, occurred in Chile, in October of 2019, you had riots that destroyed the metro system in Chile. They burned something like 40 out of 70 stations and they burned a bunch of supermarkets, especially in the poor parts of town. And the way they did it is they organized a bunch of, a bunch of people into the, into the streets and then they put in the people that were the rock throwers that were destroying everything. So that's how they, they enacted that. Now, the rest of this stuff has been going on for years, for decades. And what communists love to do is you want to be able to take care of any belief in God. If you take away God as a source of truth, who replaces it? The state. And so this is what you're seeing that's happening every day. And you want to do in education, you want to go from education to indoctrination. Traditional culture, destroy the family. Look at all this LGBTQ stuff. You want to make sure that become, people become more docile. And all of this is done in a way, I don't want to, I want to get into a dialogue with you, so I'm just giving you an idea of the framework. And you can kind of fill in the blanks just looking at what each of these institutions are and how they're all being affected. So this gives you an idea of what's going on. But typically, what these guys want is power. And to the extent that they achieve it, uh, depends on the country that they're operating in. We've been pretty good about keeping it at bay, uh, but it's not for a lack of trying on their part. So this is what's going on. And it only takes a few people to be able to change things around significantly. If you look at, at President Biden back in the day, you know, he was something else. Uh, he was not into some of these extreme measures that have been taken by this particular presidency, but this is what's happening. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I wanted to give you some food for thought and I want to ask, answer any questions that you might have. Yes, sir. Can I get a copy of that slide, sir? Absolutely. I got some, I got some right there. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned Cuba being a light. Could you elaborate, please? Say again? What were you referring to when you discussed current events in Cuba? In the last three weeks, Cuba is in flames. The, the Cuban people are fed up because they can't, they don't have enough to eat. And their slogan is food or electric energy. Comida o corriente. Corriente means current, electric current. And they're out in the streets in all the major cities. They're protesting throughout the entire country to the extent that now they are, the government is at least putting uh, some more supplies uh, into the stores where people have to live off this little booklet that rations the food that they get. So, but notice that it's not anywhere in the, in the, in the news media. It is if you start going into the Spanish uh, media and they'll, they'll describe it very aptly. Any other, yes, sir. Sir, um, a consideration, so somebody threw out a 
an idea recently about drug traffickers in light of, at, of in consideration of sex offenders. Yes. So sex offenders, there's registries. It, it's a there's a very bad stigma that, that comes with that. And so if 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 one moves into somebody's town, you, you almost see an inadvertent mobilization of the populace against that. It. I'm not seeing any sort of reaction like that with the traffickers bringing in the synthetic opioids, the, the fentanyls, the nitazines. Welcome, any thoughts on that? So the people that really make the big bucks on all these are the, the big cartel members. And like, and, and as has been mentioned before, there's two, two major cartels in Mexico. There's a Sinaloa cartel that's been around for a long time. Mr. Chapo Guzman is enjoying a little vacation in jail here in the United States. And there's the the... Jalisco Nueva Generación, which is the meanest, nastiest of the cartels. And those people are the ones that are making big money. And what they found is that people are the gift that keeps giving because you can bring somebody across the border, and if they can't pay, you just put them into indentured servitude. And part of that indentured servitude includes sex, you know, sex trafficking, prostitution, drugs, you name it. And the way that they operate is you've got the big pipelines, which is run by the cartels, and then you get into the wholesale business that is the plumbing that you can distribute throughout the United States. So the big suppliers are the cartels. The people that are distributing it on the streets are all these different gangs. I couldn't figure out how on earth is it that we can't, put a ha we can't get a handle on, on the drug trafficking. That's because the gangs are so many. And they're multinational. I mean, you've got Chinese gangs, you've got Russian gangs, you've got Mexican gangs, you've got, you name it, they're out there. And the big cartels are the big suppliers, so they're the big pipeline. And so that's the reason that it's difficult uh, to, to really hit at some of these guys because they're so dis diffused. And who are you going to blame? And what are you going to, you know, how are you going to bring those cases to court? You know, if you look at the you know, complexities of something like fentanyl, it, when I was at DASD, most of the product was coming in from China. It was already processed, produced, and ready to go. They figured out that the best way to do that is just let the Mexicans manufacture it. Remember Breaking Bad? The reason that Breaking Bad kind of went away is because the generation of the drug went to Mexico, and they produced it in, in more refined quality and, and significantly larger quantities, and that's, that's the way it works. And then the other thing is it's so small. I mean, if you look at what it takes to get an overdose with heroin, or let's start with cocaine, it's about 1,200 milligrams for an overdose. With, with heroin, it's about 200 milligrams. With fentanyl, it's two milligrams. And then you have car fentanyl, which is 50 times more potent, and it's two micrograms to kill you. So that means that it's significantly easier to bring across, and it's super cheap and easily distributed. And you can also mix it with plant-based drugs, which makes them more addictive, which means that people are going to get hooked on it much more readily, and then you've got this, this market that's already established. So you've got the drugs, you've got the human trafficking. The amount of money that the Sinaloa cartel makes is something equivalent to both the Sinaloa cartel and the Jalisco Nueva Generación, both of those cartels make as much money as the state of Nuevo León. So you want to look at the state of Nuevo León, it's the number three most wealthy state in Mexico. And so that's the kind of power that they have. Now, do you think that they can't corrupt? Take a look at how many governors under the previous administration in Mexico were indicted. It was something like uh, somewhere between I think it was between 16 and 18 that were indicted. If you look at the governors now in Mexico, none are indicted. Why is that? It's because they belong to Morena. What's Morena? It's AMLO's party. He's not going to go after them. So the corruption is still there. It's just that it's not, it's not being prosecuted. So uh, Javier Millet has been... Uh, President of Argentina now for about four months. Do you have any update on how he's doing and how much resistance, he, what kind of resistance he's had? And, and uh, furthermore, do you have any, uh, any knowledge about uh, any spillover, uh, uh, favorable spillover effect of his freedom movement into other South American countries? 
Well, I think that he's definitely a threat because in Brazil, look at the, what they're doing to any of the opposition. They, they put, they're, they're trying to put President Bolsonaro in jail because he falsified a COVID document. This is the lunacy of what they're doing. And look at what they're doing at Elon Musk in, in Brazil. So Brazil is nervous because they know that the trend line is not favorable for them. So Malay has been using his chainsaw and he has been making a mess of things and he's been stirring things up. Now, is it all perfect? No, but he's reduced civil or, or a lot of the public employees significantly. He's reduced a lot of the different ministries. Then he gets off on, sometimes he gets off on weird tangents like he wants to build a base in Rio, in, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the, in the Rio Grande, I think for, anyway, it's, it's a base to attack the Malvinas or the Falklands, and that's kind of like, nah, don't do that. But he's got to keep the people happy. It's kind of like the Venezolanos and their desire to attack Guyana. You know, this is just this is something that everybody rallies around because, you know, they it's it's that national pride that gets them all fired up, and politicians do that. But I think other than that, uh, Millet is doing a lot of really good things, and and uh, I haven't seen him lose momentum yet. But he's moving in the right in the right direction. One more question. Yes, sir. Sir, in, in regards to the border, so last couple of years we've seen the mobilization of, of reserve forces, U.S. military forces, say 15 some odd troops, 1,500 some odd troops down to the border, but yet the authority, the military authorities are, seem limited. It, it, do you see this as grandstanding and messaging, or what, what's, what's the effect? I'm going to add, you know, Mark can get to this in a minute. I'm going to give you the military side of it. I'm not a big, I'm not a big use of military for border security. I think we can provide certain services very well. We have JTF North that does that magnificently. We organize operations with the, the civil authorities, and we do that super well. We provide intelligence. We can, we can build walls. We can do all kinds of stuff. But if you just unleash the CBP, let them do their jobs, they are very, very, very good at what they do, and they do it correctly. It's a law enforcement function. The military does not need to be politicized and put into law enforcement. That's just my take. I don't think it's a good idea. I think we can still provide those services, but just if you unleash the hounds and let the CBP do their job, they know how to do it. All they need is the authority. It's that they're not being authorized to do so right now. So anyway. So thank you very much, appreciate it.